done it. So he, did you record to the cloud? Um, That's the key. I did. Okay, good. Okay. So if you want to make Pat co-host, that's up to, I don't have that power anymore. You've got the, you've got all the power, Lynn, per usual. Right, uh, right per <laughs> usual. Why give it to me? She never shares. <laughs> well, I used to have it. I just gave it up like for nothing. <laughs> Should have charged, baby. I know, dang. <laughs> You're in a mood, Polly. Yeah, because I'm signing off. <laughs> yeah, he's not even staying. I think yeah. that's a good um, way for me. Good. Oh my God! Good. How do I make you co-host? Uh, so you hover over her name, I think, where it says more. What will that allow me to do? Oh, there it is. There you go. You're now co-host, Pat. What does that mean? So you're like Ed McMahon. You're supposed to laugh at all of Lynn's jokes. <laughs> As usual. Yeah. But you know, I I know we are recording. I hate that. to say this to you, and we have people in but the no, audience. But, but they're not in yet, are they? No, they're, they're watching. They can hear us. Oh. oh, welcome to District Two. <laughs> <laughs> and there's two people named Pat DeAngelis in the audience. Well, that's because Carol is went on with my thing right. for moral support. <laughs> so I'll leave you to your own devices, counselors. Probably Thank good. You, <laughs> Thank you. Carol, I'm in, I, I can't talk to you right now. Anyway, Lynn, I, t bringing people in, I think, would be a good thing. I now have four of you in the audience. Four of me? Yes. What? That's crazy. Okay, I'm promoting people to panelists. I have no idea why you have all those Patricia DeAngelis. I really don't. I don't either. More than one of them? Four. Yeah. So let me check with Carol. Carol, did you go on several times or something? I don't know. Hi, Barbara. We're just letting people in that we know. Except I'm not letting in four Pat DeAngelis. No, one of them is Carol, I guess. Eric Backrack, promote to panelist. Hi, Barbara. Simpson. Chris. Yay. Yeah. Phone, promote to panelist. Hey, Renee and Eric. Yay. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Oh. Whoa. Whoa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody, one of you has to turn something yeah, off. Really... Carol <laughs> needs to turn some things off. Nancy, hi, Nancy. Hi, good evening. Hey, hi, Lori. Hi, Sharon. Hi, Sharon. How are you? Good, thank you. Daisy, I thought I already promoted her. Bernard. Thomas Simpson. Um, I have another person by that name in the audience. Are there two of you? Or somebody else using your web thing? Peter Wood, I can't seem to promote you. You may have an outdated. Um, nice picture, Bernard. Lisa Campbell, I'm trying to promote you to panelist and not being successful. I now have five Pat DeAngelis's. <laughs> <laughs> 
Somebody in your household, Pat, is not doing this. Good evening. We're going to get started in just a moment. Thank you for joining us. We understand there was a glitch in people receiving notifications, but I'm still not clear why. Yeah, they went out March 1st, and the first time I forgot the attachment, and then I added it. So, And then I sent a second round to some people. Uh, Lynn, could you promote one of the Pat DeAngelis's? Because I think it's Carol. We just did, but she's not happening. Hi, Lori. All right, let's... Um, huh. Julie Bridegan, Getty, Getty is coming in. I did just promote a Pat DeAngelis. Um, Jane. I'm gonna go check on Bibi. Carol. Okay. I'm just copying. Yeah, just because. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. And. Okay. Um, I'm going to keep looking for new names as they arrive. I've tried to promote um, a couple people in the audience, and they don't seem to be coming in, which doesn't make any sense unless you haven't updated your Zoom. Now it's happening. You. If you don't want to be seen, you can always, of course, turn your picture off. But we do ask you to turn your sound off. But it's actually nice to see people. Yeah, but I'm eating. <laughs> I told you it's great when we can see each other. Yay! Is it possible to turn on chat so we can have a better exchange of opinions? I hate to say it, but unfortunately with this version of Zoom, we don't have chat. I know. It, it's, there's nothing we can do about it. It's, this is the Towns version, and because it's a webinar, we can't turn on chat. Perlan, you have your hand up. Would you like to say something? Perlan? She's muted. I did not mean to. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Lynn, can you bring in Amber Cano Martin? And yeah, I'm trying. Okay, I'm sorry. And there's Kitty. Let's see if she comes in. Rudy Perkins. Excuse me, also we can't find where the hand raising is or how to put questions in the q and Is there some? We'll explain that in just a moment. Um, I need to know who is at, I'm going to ask the person at 1917-453-3300 Four five three three four two two, to please identify yourself. Pat, you have. Oh, that's not Pat. Um, that's probably Carol. No, Carol's okay. gone off, so don't promote me from that list, Lynn. Okay. All right. I can always Michael throw Lipinski. you back out again. Yeah. Michael Lipinski is, uh, should be brought in. Renee Moss, unless she's with, no. Okay. Jim Johnson. I can't seem to promote Renee. Uh, maybe now it works. We'll see. 
Okay. Mindy, is that you at 917-453-3422? Could you? Hi. Hi, it's me, 3422. I'm a resident. Thank you. Um, can you tell Thank us your you. name? I, Ewan. Ewan? Thank I you. The, yeah. I live Great. in the neighborhood. I'm sorry, I don't have the Zoom app, so I can only hear. But I'm going to mute myself, and I'll just listen. Thank you. Thank you. We're glad to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Right, Kobe in. Okay, so let me explain. We're this is the town's um, version of Zoom. It's a webinar version, and as a result, we cannot have a chat feature, which I regret um, immensely. Uh, but I want to make sure that if you would like us to uh, provide information, if you did not receive one of our notices, please email us at our Amherst, um, at our um, emails for the town. Yeah, mine is, yes, okay, mine is Greesmer, G-R-I-E-S-E-M-E-R-L at amherstma.gov. And I'm DeAngelis, D-E-A-N-G-E-L-I-S-P at amherstmass.gov. How did you, Marcy Sclove is in as, yes. how, why are you in as Patricia <laughs> DeAngelis? I have no idea, maybe it's my alter ego. <laughs> <laughs> can, Marcy, can you change your name? I certainly can. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to promote the others. It's frustrating. You have more hair than I have. <laughs> <laughs> but you have more soul than I have. So what, what can we say? <laughs> uh, Perlan, you have your hand up. Is there something you wanted to say? No, okay. I was just trying to get a better view. Oh. So okay. my, I've tried to get my arm down, but it's just wanting to stay up. If you go, you, you go back to the raise hand function. Yeah, okay. I have. Oh, there we are. Okay, it's yeah. down. Okay, and uh, okay, I'm Ophelia. Um, all right, let's get started. We are expecting Mindy Dom. I know that she's driving from the state house uh, and she will be calling in. Uh, but meantime, we do have uh, Congressman um, hold on. Let me just make sure I have that. Kobe, are you here? Yeah, you are. Okay. Congressman McGovern, McGovern's um, res, is his um, Western Massachusetts representative, and that's Kobe Gardner Levine. And Kobe was going to give us about three to five minutes of some quick updates, and then you can ask him questions. You can make requests, whatever you want to do. Okay, Kobe, you want to go ahead? Sure. Um, well, thank you, Lynn. Good evening, everybody. Um, as, as Lynn just mentioned, uh, my name is Kobe Gardner-Levine. I work in Jim McGovern's office over in Northampton, um, so, so just a little ways away from Amherst. Um, so I, I was asked tonight to talk about some federal updates, and, and I think the best way to spend this time is to kind of jump right into the omnibus uh, appropriations package that passed last week. Um, and just for background, this is the largest domestic spending increase in four years um, and delivers, I think, some pretty incredible investments that are necessary to meet the challenges that we're living in this moment in time. Um, and I also want to say that it gets the United States off of the budget from the Trump administration, um, which is huge. So as, as a broad overview, uh, the bill contains $13.6 billion in emergency funding for security and humanitarian needs for Ukraine. 
Um, it contains an increase in funding for key domestic priorities, such as uh, Pell Grants, um, establishing President Biden's new ARPA-H cancer initiative. And uh, th these investments are designed to create good paying jobs and lower the costs for families. Um, and the bill also secures major bipartisan legislation, such as the uh, reauthorizing, I should say, the Violence Against Women Act, creating new cybersecurity protections to fight against uh, cyber attacks to our infrastructure, um, just to name a couple. Um, so when we look at uh, the portion of the legislation that's specific to Ukraine that I, that I just mentioned a moment ago, um, the goal, of course, is to hold Russia accountable and isolate it further um, from the global economy. But I think with that said, we need to also be cognizant of making sure that we protect our own economic interests here in the US, which is why the House of Representatives also move forward with a strong bill that would ban the import of Russian oil um, and energy products into the US, um, which would cut off a major source of revenue for Putin. Um, and separately, as we work to diminish the Russian economy, we remain focused also on bringing down energy costs for American families, as well as our global partners. Um, and the bill also takes some steps to review Russia's access to the World Trade Organization, review how we can further diminish Russia and the global economy. Uh, but another key thing that I wanted to mention in the bill is that it reauthorizes and strengthens Congressman McGovern's uh, uh, Global Magnitsky Human Rights and Accountability Act, which is more commonly known as, as the Global Magnitsky Act. Um, so that the U.S. can impose further sanctions on Russia. And just for some background context on that, um, in 2012, Congress took bipartisan action with the Magnitsky Act to impose sanctions on human rights abusers in Russia, while also normalizing trade relations. Um, and this standard was actually expanded in 2016 to apply globally, so broadening human rights, um, abuses that, that can be punished with the sanctions and bolstering coordination with our partners. And so this new bill that I just mentioned a moment ago would actually actually extends the Global Magnitsky Act so that the US can continue to punish Russian oligarchs um, and top government officials uh, for these heinous attacks that we're seeing on Ukrainian civilians um, and the violation of Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. Um, so uh, on a bipartisan and bicameral basis, um, Congress is going to continue to work with the administration to take every potential action to limit the costs of Putin's aggression on American families and also to blunt the effects of the price hike. Um, and that means focusing on ensuring, ensuring stability of global oil markets while also working to diversify our energy supply. Um, and you probably saw in, in the news that the administration has already announced its plans to release more than 90 million barrels from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve this, this current fiscal year. Um, and to support the Ukrainian people and frankly, democracy, um, Congress is also enacting emergency funding that includes billions in humanitarian, uh, military and economic support as, as part of our omnibus government funding legislation. Um, and, and we're also working to help ensure air support for the Ukrainian armed forces. Um, and, and, and to clarify that a bit, uh, you've probably heard President Biden has said very clearly that uh, American troops will not go to war in Ukraine, but, but our nation can provide military equipment and, and support our allies who are struggling um, and, and supplying airplanes to Ukraine. Um, and we also need to need to help the 2 million uh, approximately Ukrainian refugees who are fleeing their homes and escaping to other nations, um, which uh, the UN has actually said is the fastest growing refugee crisis in Europe since World War II. And this, this funding that I just mentioned also comes um, on the heels of $1 billion that we've committed in security assistance to Ukraine over the past year. Um, so just switching away from Ukraine for a moment, I, I also wanted to remind everyone on this call that uh, a year ago last week, President Biden enacted the American Rescue Plan, uh, which frankly turned the tide on the pandemic, um, put shots into arms, getting people back to work, children back safely in schools and, and money in, in people's pockets. Um, and Following that legislation, we've set a new record actually for jobs created, small businesses started, economic growth, um, and, and shrinking unemployment in, in spite of the hardships caused by the pandemic. Um, so for our community in, in this uh, omnibus bill, I also wanted to mention a couple of other specifics um, for, for our region. Um, the first is that 
Congressman McGovern secured two and a half million dollars for the 33 Hawley Street project in Northampton, the Hawley Center for the Arts. Um, and, and you may have seen in today's Gazette, uh, the, that, that was one of the articles that kind of detailed that process. I'm happy to get into that a bit more if, if folks have questions. Um, but actually earlier today, um, myself and a couple other members of our team were with the congressman there for an official announcement um, of that funding. Um, in, in downtown Northampton. And the second uh, uh, item that I wanted to mention was uh, Congressman McGovern also secured $1 million for a robotics program and scholarships at, at our own UMass Amherst right here in town. Um, and, uh, and, and so that's, uh, of course, um, money that's coming directly back into our, our town, our community, um, our education. Um, and, and so separately from that, Many, many of you who've heard the congressman talk over the years have probably heard him talk about hunger and, and food insecurity. Um, it's one of his uh, major issues that he's been focused on over the course of his career. And uh, I, I wanted to share that um, a, as a result of working tirelessly with the Biden administration, um, to, the congressman has actually uh, just achieved one of his goals, which is to uh, make sure that we convene um, during this current administration, a White House conference on food, nutrition, health, and hunger. Um, so just kind of as, uh, as a general overview of that, this is a conference that's designed to bring together stakeholders from across the federal government, local governments, mm -hmm researchers, students, uh, people with lived experiences, um, and, and the goal is to create a plan to finally end hunger by the year 2030, um, because we wanna create a system that allows people more choice, um, especially to fresh produce and, and to locally grown food. Um, and in our area, we, we have quite a lot of that. Our, our local farmers are on the front lines um, in, in, uh, in creating a, a better system. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm pleased to announce that uh, Congressman McGovern has secured the funding necessary to finally make this conference mm -hmm. a reality. Um, and, and so I wanted to make sure I, I brought that up tonight. So I, I know that was um, a broad overview, but I, I hope that was helpful to um, understand the omnibus bill a little bit better. And, and I also wanted to say on behalf of the Congressman that we, we definitely know that there is more work to be done. Um, in his State of the Union address, we heard President Biden um, speak powerfully to the issues facing America's working families and Democrats plan to lower their costs. And right now we're working to make more goods in America and to lower everyday costs of energy, childcare, prescription drugs, um, the, the list goes on. Um, but, but our office uh, believes that these are essential to creating a, a better and a more just country. And, and while these changes haven't been as quick as we would hope, we are accomplishing quite a lot and, and we will continue to fight for more. Um, and, and so with that, I'd like to turn it back over to you, Lynn. Great. Um, let me just mention that there are 28 of us in the room and there are 15 more that I've been trying to bring into the room, but I can't for some reason. I think it may be the version that they have of Zoom. But uh, so I'm. Uh, we're gonna take a, a Kobe has agreed to take a few questions. I would like to also just acknowledge that Kobe is one of our Amherst Regional High School graduates. And so he's a young man come home, which was really nice. Uh, Lori Golder, Goldner, you have your hand up. Uh, hi, Kobe, and thank you for that. I wanted to point out one more thing that was in that omnibus bill um, that, that uh, uh, McGovern and also Ed Markey and um, our senators basically uh, supported, which was a million dollar earmark for the Energy Transition Institute at UMass, whose goals are very much aligned with the stated goals of Town Council and the Energy and Climate Action Committee. So I thought there was a nice report on that in the Amherst Indy on Friday, if anybody wants to look at it. The opening was last week or a couple, last week, I think. Yeah, it was last Monday, yes. Thanks, Lori. Are there any questions for Kobe at this point? Or requests, you know, once in a while you get his ear. I, I should also say um, that I'm happy to leave my information uh, for folks. Uh, Lynn, I don't know if maybe you're able to uh, send that out to some sort of listserv, but I, I'd be happy to pass that on as well, since I, I know we have quite a few folks on this call. Why don't I send it out in a follow-up email? Okay. All right. Um, are there, and then we have Mindy Dom, who is in her car driving back from Boston. And Mindy, uh, you want to give us provide us with a brief update on things that are going on. 
I think I gave you permission to talk. Now I have to ask you to unmute. Can you, Lynn, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hello? Yes. Okay, great. Hi, everybody. I'm sorry I'm not on camera, and um, I hope to give you um, a brief update on what's going on in the state. But first, I really have to shout out Kobe. I think he's an amazing um, representative for Congressman McGovern. We're really lucky to have him in our region to support not only our political and sort of issue efforts, but a really terrific caseworker for residents who are having problems with the federal government, you know, whether it's the Department of the IRS or the State Department with passports. They're just a really phenomenal office. Um, I always feel lucky to have Jim McGovern as my congressman, as I know many people in Amherst uh, do, but I also feel lucky that we have Kobe as his rep. So I just want to thank him because that was a really unbelievably explicit, specific, and great update. So I'll try to be a little brief. I just want to give an update on some legislation that I think is of importance to folks and some community um, sort of services that I've heard a lot about. So on legislation, I, I get a lot of questions from people, including from Lynn, about the status of the home rule that would allow Amherst to have ranked choice voting. And at this point, that bill is still in committee, which is a good sign. It was extended because they couldn't make a decision about it by February 2nd. It's extended until the middle of next month. And I am continuing to work with the chairperson to try to get it out of committee and to be able to be voted on and passed. And from the House, it would go to the Senate. From the Senate, it would get passed and then hopefully get to the governor's desk um, for his signature and for enactment. So we are still what they call working that bill, but the good news is it's still alive and kicking and able to be worked. So that's a great thing. Um, two weeks ago, or last week, I think maybe two weeks ago, we passed um, a big bill in the House of Representatives on offshore wind. You might have heard about it. It's a really incredible piece of legislation that makes Massachusetts a leader in the development, manufacturing, production, and education, and workforce training that's needed for offshore wind, and also includes research and development, which is the piece of the process that will come back to Amherst through hopefully the UMass Amherst Wind Center. Um, there'll be R&D affiliated with this bill. There'll be training. There'll be training for high school students as part of this bill, as well as manufacturer production and distribution. And there's also battery storage technology associated with it because how else are we going to get the wind energy from Nantucket to Amherst, Pelham, and Granby? So that is a really exciting bill. People have said to me since we passed the climate uh, roadmap bill, so when are you actually going to do something besides just do the roadmap? And I really look at this bill as the first step, not the last, on how we make that roadmap a reality. So. It takes the goals, the climate goals that the House and the Senate set, and it says, so here's how we're going to do it with wind. And there'll probably be more climate-based legislation um, coming out of the legislature before June. So stay tuned for that. I know that's important to our district, and I think there's going to be a lot of activity on that um, in the House. Some of you may know we also passed the Votes Act a couple of weeks ago. and. Um, Pieces of this act that are very good that we all support are things like making mail-in voting permanent, extending early voting periods. It cut the registration period to 10 days. It allows for no excuse absentee voting. As far as I'm concerned, a major um, issue in, in Massachusetts that people should not have to have a specific excuse in order to um, vote absentee. They should just need to vote absentee. But you may also be aware that that bill had an amendment in it to allow for election day registration, which failed. I supported it. Um, I opposed the effort to fight it. I was not successful, but we put up a really good fight because the, um, the vote on the election day registration was pretty close by House of Representatives standards. And it actually is in conflict with the Senate bill so it had to go to conference committee, and we're all really, we're advocating and we're hoping 
that what will come out of the conference committee is election day registration. So I'm happy to take questions on that, but stay tuned. The way it works now, if nothing happens with election day registration specifically, is because the bill extended early voting and at the same time cut the time period for registration, there will be a couple of days of election day registration, but that's actually not good enough. We need election day registration on primary day, and we need election day registration on the general election day. And in Amherst, we particularly need that, like other college communities, because a lot of people don't move back into our area until a day or two before the primary. And they need to be able to vote um, as residents, just as if they lived here for the 10 days prior. So we're gonna continue to work on that. We also last week passed a supplemental budget. This included money for rental assistance, some COVID related tasks, but I think most importantly to people that I've heard from, it also included refugee resettlement money, specifically for Ukrainian refugees. So um, that's good news. It'll also be able to be used by Afghani refugees, but it ex expanded and increased what we're doing for refugees in Massachusetts. We are coming into budget season, which means that there'll be um, lots of opportunities for people to basically tell me what they want to see in the budget, whether specifically or just generally, and you should take the opportunity to let me know what you think we should be spending money on and what you think we shouldn't be spending money on. Um, it will also be an opportunity for me to try to get some earmarks for local priorities. I'm really proud that in the last ARPA budget, I was able to get some really good earmarks for organizations in our community like the Amherst Mobile Market to increase food security in our community, the um, Amherst Public Schools to support mental health services for students, um, money for the Drake, the new performing arts venue downtown, um, as well as the Amherst Survival Center um, and other um, organizations. So I'm gonna to continue to try to get some of the, our priorities funded specifically in addition to generally. And I think the last update, because I probably have talked too long at this point, is a little bit on the UMass test state. People are beginning to understand that the governor announced last week or two weeks ago, maybe, maybe 10 days ago, that they were going to close many of the stop the spread sites across the state for COVID-19. Amherst is one of those sites, leaving Western Massachusetts with just two sites in Springfield. I saw today that I'm really happy about this, that the town has submitted a letter requesting that the site stay open. Senator Comerford and I led an effort of uh, representatives and state senators and sent a letter to the state on Friday urging that the site remain open, that it's not only an access issue for residents to be able to get free PCR testing, but in our perspective, it's also a way to do surveillance because rapid tests do not get surveilled. And in our community, we need to know um, if they're, particularly because of the college populations, if we're experiencing outbreaks. And, you know, it, it goes back to like what believe it or not, Trump said at the beginning of the pandemic, right? If you don't test, then you don't know. We're not in that situation. We want to know. So we need to make sure that that testing exists. Um, I've had some good luck with legislation. Some of my bills have been advanced from committee. I'm happy to um, let you know what they are. If you're interested, I will leave that to question and answer because I don't want to necessarily presume, but I think I probably have spoken enough. Lynn, am I, have I reached my time limit? You have. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, I'm going to ask now if there are people who have questions of Mindy. Please raise your hand. And make sure that you subscribe to Mindy's uh, regular um, newsletter. It's electronic and has a lot. So we have one hand up. Jacob Hirsch, please unmute and state your question. There you go. Hi, thanks. Um, <clears throat> I'm Jack Hirsch at um, Flat Hills Road. And I'm just wondering, Hi, uh, this question could be either for uh, Mindy or Kobe or both. 
but um, there is uh, um, what what is the effort um, to fund um, entrepreneurial new energy, clean energy supplies. There's a company in East Hampton called Fluid Power Symptoms. That's F L O O I D, um, which um, has a really interesting approach to developing clean energy. It can be incorporated into the design of buildings, and it's just one of many new approaches. It seems like um, all of the politicos are jumping on solar as the only solution. Although, Mindy, I realize you're talking about wind too, although that's very limited in where it can go. Um, but anyway, I'd, I'd well, like to hear about alternative energy uh, sources. Well, I'm certainly not a person that, I'm not a scientific engineer, so I can't like, you know, I would have never been in a position to judge one energy source over another. But I think if you know that company, they may want to reach out to their rep, who is Dan Carey in East Hampton, because first of all, there's a lot of small business grants right now out there. Um, but there's also an effort on the part of the governor, as well as the legislature, to look at something called clean heat, which is the way we heat our buildings. How should we go about doing that? And that has some alternative energy pieces into it. But I think there's interest in that. But I think it's more about potentially asking that um, companies, getting that companies in connect, contact with their representative to maybe meet with the, um, someone in either the Secretary of Economic Development's office or the Energy and Environmental Affairs Secretariat to sort of brainstorm how they can go about seeking state support. I wouldn't write it off. I think it's just about meeting with the right people. Kitty Axelson Berry. Okay, am I on? You are. Okay, great. Thank Hi, you. Kitty. Uh, Hi, Kitty Axelson Berry from 89 Stony Hill Road in Amherst. Mindy, um, I'm sure that you're aware of the Hamden County um, Courthouse. I know it's not part of your district. Um, mm -hmm. The Roderick Ireland Courthouse, that is. Um, full of mold and dust. And there have been five people with ALS in recent years there, three, three judges of whom died from ALS in the last few years. They had, two of them had the same office. The other one had an office like right nearby. There have been 60 plus cases of cancer there that many people feel are because of the um, bad air. And there have recently been some um, air samples done and it has, the courthouse has the worst kind of molds and toxins. The sheriff in Hamden County just decided that he's not gonna let his inmates into that courthouse. Um, so although it's not part of your territory, I'm sure that you have um, a lot of people here who work there. Okay, my daughter works there. She doesn't live in Amherst, but um, she does work there. And we're really concerned about her health and the health of other people um, who work or have to appear at that courthouse. Is there a way that you can help apply pressure on the state level to having that, having people not have to work there, having a new courthouse built? We don't think that um, trying to remediate it after they've been trying to remediate it for so many years will work, or at least have it studied, have an epidemiologist study. Can you, um, is, do you have the power to you know, help out with that? I, well, you put the question perfectly. I absolutely have the quote unquote power to help out with that. Meaning I have the ability on behalf of the district to support as an ally and advocate with my colleagues who represent Springfield about the courthouse, which I've been doing. Um, so what we, in this situation, you know, when I first heard about it, I contacted the reps in Springfield and said, what do you need from me? And my job then is to be their partner and to do what they need me to do. So in, that, in this case, it's either sign on to letters, make sure that they know that I support what they want to do. I believe the governor has talked about replacing the courthouse. Um, I, Kobe may have some information on the federal level, but I think on the state level, there is an effort to replace the state, the courthouse. Um, and I'm supportive of that. When it comes to Springfield, I need to say that I basically, um, don't shy away from lending whatever support delegation. 
You know, the, it, Springfield is the largest city in Western Mass. It's also the most disadvantaged city in Western Massachusetts. And I'm very aware that we live on the I-91 corridor together. And that part of our, my job as a Western Mass um, legislator is to support the development and the health of Springfield. So for that reason, I would I enthusiastically, you know, join them about the courthouse. I'm an enthusiastic opponent of biomass in Springfield. Um, I try, I've worked hard to try to make sure that Springfield also has access to vaccination and testing for COVID-19 and those sort of things. So I think it's not, it's appropriate to ask Kitty because I think those of us who are in the northern part of the valley need to support our brothers and sisters in the southern part of the valley. So thank you for asking. It's good to know that constituents are concerned about it. Bernard uh, Brennan, please come state your name and where you live and go forward. Hi, Bernard Brennan, Northeast Street. Um, I wanted to thank you, Mindy, for your support of the Amherst mobile market, as well as the uh, testing sites. Both have been really important to my farm. And I don't know if this is a legislation request or a funding request, but I'd love to see the process of changing speed limits become easier or get funded. And my local reps know my particular uh, problem on my street. But uh, I, I bring it up as, a, as, an, as an everyday quality of life issue that affects a lot of people and should be considered. Thank you. Thank you very much for pointing it out to me and also your town councilors. Great. Uh, Andy, you have your hand up. Andy Steinberg is a counselor at large with us and has joined us for the evening. Andy, go ahead. Hi, uh, thank you. I, first of all, I wanna say hi to everybody because uh, I represent the, this district and all of the districts as a counselor at large, as you know, I run townwide. Um, there are two issues that I just wanted to really quickly um, um, point out that we're working on in the council and they're concerned about one is for Mindy and one is for Kobe. Uh, Mindy, the issue on the state level, and I can send you more about it um, later, but I'll mention it because we have a number of concerned um, residents here, it has to do with um, the amount that the MSBA, the Mass School Building Authority, appears that they may be willing to match the um, construction costs of new elementary school, which we so badly need. And there are a couple of problems that we're finding. One is that the construction costs have really been increasing substantially on all kinds of construction projects in the, um, everywhere, uh, but it's affecting public buildings. And uh, so what we, had estimated when we started the process was going to be an $80 million school, may end up being a $100 million school. And there's a question of whether um, MSBA um, is going to uh, take up their portion of the increase in the cost of construction, um, or whether they're going to have some sort of expectation that it fall on, um, entirely or almost entirely on the town. And uh, this creates some big problems for us that Lynn and I have been talking about quite a bit. And the other aspect of that one is that um, MSBA is uh, uh, very good about talking about the benefits of net zero energy school buildings, but they don't seem to be interested in paying for any portion of the cost of um, making a building that zero energy ready or um, equipped. And as a consequence, um, we have some um, things that we're just struggling right now to figure out as to how to move uh, this forward and be able to fund the project. We haven't reached conclusions, but we're working on it and um, Lynn, might choose to add to that because she's working on that with me. The other one um, for Kobe is that uh, uh, Pat DeAngelis and I and, a cup and another counselor are um, trying to develop um, something that we is really aimed towards the federal level. And that is um, a resolution 
um, that would support um, an issue that's going on right now on a federal level, and that is uh, the president doing something about student loan um, uh, cancellation. And uh, we know that there has been a pandemic-related pause in payments on student loans, which is um, scheduled to end fairly soon. And uh, this is a uh, huge burden on our economy and on, our, on a lot of our constituents and um, something that uh, we're uh, concerned about. And uh, I don't know if you have any knowledge of what's uh, currently being considered um, on either in the administration or in Congress to assist on that issue. So those are the two topics. Thank you. Let me just mention that um, Mindy, your office and Paul's office and my calendar, uh, and also uh, Senator Comerford confirmed a meeting at, on Friday, uh, specifically to talk about the MSBA funding problem. And uh, we've been working with Mindy and Joe for a while, and they've also been talking to MSBA. So we might get to that as we go into later issues, but either Kobe or uh, Mindy, did either of you want to comment on either of those items? Well, th thank you, Andy, um, that as far as the, the question of, of student loans, well, first, let me say, uh, Northampton, you, you may know, uh, what did a similar resolution um, to the one that you mentioned, uh, they had uh, put forth a resolution about this, this exact um, concern. Uh, as, as far as anything concrete, I, I'm not sure I can offer that. What, what I, because I think we're still kind of on the federal level, right, in a bit of a wait and see period on that front, um, because the, the information has not been necessarily provided as to what exactly is going to happen on that front. Um, but what I will say is that uh, in, er, earlier today, or, or maybe it was late last night. Um, that there was kind of talk floated, uh, you, some of you may have seen uh, about um, potentially extending that, that freeze that you mentioned. Uh, I think it was the White House Chief of Staff um, who, who said that another pause to the payments could be in the cards, but sort of a more to come on that. Um, nothing, nothing committal, but, but that was sort of the, the latest direction that I was aware of um, as, as to that question of student loans. Okay. Mindy, any other comments before we go on with the rest of our meeting? Um, no, we'll probably continue to see what we can do around MSBA. If there's a new climate bill that comes out in the spring, we'll probably look to see if there can be a climate fund attached to it or introduce legislation in the next session. Um, I'm interested in seeing how we can maybe get MSBA to pick up more of their share of the increase in construction costs as a result of the supply chain. Um, but as many of you know, when I ran for office, people asked what I was going to do about the school, because at that point, we were not online for the MSBA funding. We had taken ourselves out of the line. And I said, my first thing is I'm going to be trying to get us back into the line. So being on the line and being able to access funding makes sense, if, especially if MSBA picks up their fair share. So. We'll continue to fight active fight. Okay, thanks, Mindy. You know what? I'm also going to provide your information and the link to your newsletter when I send out Kobe's information as well. Okay. Thank thanks you both for, for joining us. And you're welcome to continue to listen. Uh, Pat, I think you and I uh, would would agree that uh, we want to move to hearing what other people are interested in talking about. I can't even yes. find you, Pat. There you are. <laughs> I'm up here Okay, <laughs> on my screen. Yeah, right. I'd like to hear, we were gonna talk about our committee assignments and stuff, but I would like to go directly to your concerns and questions. Right. Um, so raise your hand. If you're in the audience, you can also raise your hand. I just haven't been able to figure out how to bring you in. Uh, Chris Riddle, please unmute. I'm Chris Riddle, Strong Street, Amherst, um, and a uh, one of the, among others on the on this uh, screen here, 
creators of the zero energy bylaw. And I just like um, our two, uh, my two reps to comment on uh, on the likelihood that there will be an effort to weaken the bylaw, um, I, which I hope won't happen. Chris, thank you for giving me the opportunity and then we'll turn to Pat. I have no intention of weakening that bylaw. Uh, I was part of the group that also drew up the second one uh, uh, that was the one that passed town meeting uh, right before the dissolution of town meeting. Uh, I, I believe that once we build the elementary school, we will find things that we hadn't anticipated. And we may at that point have to do something with the bylaw that allows for some other kind of arrangement, but I can't even anticipate that now. I know that while we were in the process of developing that bylaw, which was right before I went, I ran for council, town council, um, it was just amazing to work with Chris and Rudy Perkins and others on that bylaw because they know this world and they brought to the table enormous knowledge. The other thing that I think uh, we need to realize and this came out during the many, many meetings about the building uh, that went on in the last two or three weeks. And that is, there seems to be enough room on site to put the amount of photovoltaics that need to be there for this school. So, and the bylaw really encourages, asks, requires that we in fact use the site for the use of photovoltaics. So those will be new additions to this as well. The irony in all of this is taking this school to net zero isn't the most expensive piece. It is the construction costs and the rising construction costs and the fact that the MSBA has not kept up with those costs. And I don't just mean the most recent inflationary problem. I mean, over the last several years. So that's where I stand on the bylaw. I don't want to reopen it. Um, I am only one counselor of 13, but that's where I stand. Pat? And I'm also just one counselor of 13, but Lee, uh, Lynn and I will be voting the same way to maintain and uh, keep the strength of the net zero bylaw in place. So you have our word on that. Okay. Chris, thank you. Uh, Tom, Tomas Simpson, please correct how I've said your name if I did something incorrect, okay? Tom is close enough. Okay. <laughs> uh, when you have, have a, a name like Reese where you kind of go with that, you know? <laughs> I have a couple of topics. I understand the zoning bylaw is being uh, looked at, and uh, I did some time on the zoning board. And one type of application that always drew immense public interest was when a duplex uh, special permit application for a non occupied uh, duplex came up in the residential neighborhood. And uh, under Article 3.3211 in the RN zoning districts, non-owner occupied duplexes are allowed with a special permit. And I think a change that should be made is that that uh, non-owner occupied duplexes should not be allowed, period, in the RN districts. Um, when you have the duplexes, that, and that immediately opens up a, a, a building for at least eight uh, occupants who are going to be college students and the neighbors were always completely opposed to this. But um, because it was allowed by the zoning bylaw, there was not a lot the board could do about it except put as many conditions on it as we could think. Um, Townwide, as regarding the rental registration, uh, there is a uh, complaint response plan form that the zoning board used in the uh, aforementioned cases. 
that I think should be extended to all residential uh, uh, permits uh, townwide. What that does is it gives the neighbors um, the uh, names and phone numbers and addresses of the property managers, the owners of the property, and uh, the tenants, so that three o'clock in the morning when there's a problem going on, uh, the property owner can be awakened with a phone call by a, an abutter instead of having to wait for the police to uh, come or probably uh, in the future be the uh, crisis response teams. Um, but uh, I think that would be a uh, good tool for abutters to uh, college uh, occupied college student occupied housing to uh, maintain peace in, in their neighborhoods. And uh, that, <coughs> excuse me, complaint response plan form should be posted on the town website for each property so that uh, those numbers and addresses are available. Uh, another topic uh, concerns my local neighborhood here on Blackberry Lane. There's apparently, uh, there's a, uh, there's a presently a uh, case before the Conservation Commission regarding some clear cutting of a lot on Tuckerman or two lots on Tuckerman. Um, and uh, I've not been involved in that. I don't know both sides of the story, but from reading the emails floating around from uh, residents of the neighborhood, the uh, contractor involved has uh, displayed an antagonistic attitude to the Conservation Commission. And uh, I'd like the uh, town to uh, support the Conservation Commission in showing some spine and getting some uh, penalties to resolve this uh, situation. So, um, Pat, if you don't mind, I'll go first go and mention that your comments regarding the rental bylaws are just absolutely time on and absolutely the right time to raise it. Uh, there are a group of counselors that have been meeting and working on issues related to the rental bylaw. We will have our first meeting about that at 5.30 on Monday night, March 21st. It'll be one hour where they will begin talking with the rest of the council about some of the things they're thinking about. They're looking at other places like State College where Penn State is and looking at how to strengthen the rental bylaw, uh, which it, it's interesting, it affects every district in the town. It is not just around the university, it is in all of our neighborhoods and, and in different ways. So um, I will carry these two uh, comments forward and make sure that they are raised as we begin the look at this bylaw. Uh, Pat, did you wanna comment on that? Uh, I agree with you on that. I'm gonna comment a little bit on the duplexes I'm going to be, I'm just beginning to look at this uh, issue. And um, I'm going to be working with uh, Councillor Haneke on um, uh, duplexes. And um, I was th even thinking triplexes. But uh, the idea of owner occupied uh, being the major requirement, I feel a little more, I feel open about that because I really think that if, that you can have duplexes and they're not necessarily all gonna be rented by students. They're gonna be rented by working families as well. And so I, I see it as a way of addressing housing. I'm, I really wanna look at this issue. So at some point, Thomas, I would actually like to meet with you because I think that 
right off the top of my head, I feel a little resistance to saying it has to be owner occupied. So, but I would like to meet with you because I do know and I honor and respect the kinds of issues that people on Blackberry and Grantwood and have been having with students and the rental registration by law and really implementing it, getting more inspectors on board uh, really needs to be looked at. We cannot be asking landlords to do their own certification. I think that's a mistake that we need to be certifying uh, each residence. Um, so that's kind of where I am with that. Um, and I'm trying to think what the other issue was. Well, the other one is Tuckerman. Oh, and that yeah, the, just came to Pat's and my attention about 10 days ago. Right. We've been in contact with the town manager. Uh, it is in front of the Conservation Commission. Uh, there has been another instance in Amherst where somebody did something similar and they ended up having to do some significant restoration and planting of trees to bring uh, the wetlands back to what they were supposed to be. And uh, the, our Conservation Commission, if you've never had an opportunity to watch them, I strongly recommend it. It is one of our strongest and most powerful boards uh, in Amherst. And it has some enormously talented and well-educated people on it that know these issues. And we have been lucky, Anna Devlin Gothier, who was on the Conservation Commission, is now a counselor. So she brings that to the council as well. I don't know the results of what the Conservation Commission will do. I just know that it is before them at this time. Okay. Uh, Thank you for bringing it up. Thank you. Uh, Eric, uh, you had your hand up quick. I wanted to call on Julie, but go ahead. Oh, uh, pardon me, Lynn. I, I, I just have a, a, a question, if, um, unless it, this is not the right time to ask. Um, but um, thank you so much. And thank you so much for uh, bringing us all together um, tonight. I have a question pertaining to um, uh, at a, at the most recent, or not the most recent, the last meeting, I think, in December of the planning board, uh, we were uh, made aware of a uh, a compact between Amherst and Shutesbury regarding the the water protect watershed protected area in Shutesbury that that flows uh, that um, through which two uh, main uh, tributaries to the Atkins Reservoir flow, and I was wondering whether there what the status of the kind of the compact is. I know that I, at least I remember that it was the recommended by the Pioneer Planning Commission that the two towns agree upon um, a, a large, a kind of a larger watershed protection um, notion than, than what was, not real, they was actually, it was, it was hope that a, a specific bylaw would be crafted to protect that area. And I, I'm wondering what, 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 has, what has transpired since that kind of, the the um, the idea that um, we never entered into the compact in in two thousand and five and what what uh, what's the um, situation regarding that? Pat, unless you know something, I'm going to just have to say we'll have to find out and get back. Yeah, to we have to find out. I apologize, Eric. No, thank you. Okay, so I see we have three. Uh, seeing some more hands raised, uh, Julie. Yes. Hi, Lynn and Pat. Hi. Everyone. I am Julie Brigham Gruddy. I'm on 26 Rosemary Street. And the reason I'm on tonight is because I'm a member of Emanuel Lutheran Church. And for the past several months, we've been hosting Craig's Doors in our church 24 7, particularly due to the COVID. It was an originally an agreement that we would host people during the day or at night only. And it really has raised the issue of how, you may, uh, how, how Amherst in general is going to deal with this homeless crisis without penalizing or at least leaning on the churches uh, because it was in the Baptist church for a while and it's moved around. We've got people in the university lodge. And I just think we as a group of really concerned 
heartfelt citizens need to think about putting together a, a facility that's going to deal with this so we do not have them on our streets. If you've been to Portland, Oregon or other places, we don't want that. And, and but we know that homelessness is an issue and we need to deal with it. So I'd really like to hear how, how we can all work together to um, um, find a solution, maybe a permanent building and also provide um, uh, space within that environment for Craig's Doors and other groups to be helping our homeless citizens. So um, I really like to hear your comments on that. And um, I, I will take them back to our church community who are currently supporting um, these homeless people in our uh, congregation uh, every night. Yeah, thank, you all, thank you for doing that. Pat, you wanna go? Yeah, I'll go a little bit first. Um, one of the things that's happening is that we did create um, a housing and homelessness committee, a working group. Uh, and uh, the um, director of the senior center uh, was leading that and she has left Amherst and that committee has kind of fallen apart. And it's a critical committee. Uh, and we're, I've been talking to the town manager and we're, we're looking at how to revive that. Um, we really need a permanent shelter. We need permanent housing. Um, and um, so that's something that's actively being looked at. And I would, you know, again, Julie, uh, like Thomas, I'd like you to contact me so we can uh, uh, really talk about it. Um, I will say that the, ch the churches have thank I am grateful for the churches coming forward and we can't lose you because this is a transition that's, that's really critically important. But there are some things in the works uh, in terms of the possibility of buying property to put a permanent shelter that I can't talk about right now, uh, but that is also uh, lo being looked at very uh, directly. Well, I appreciate wanna, appreciate yeah. that because it's 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 we can't just keep moving people around and I think stability will lead to getting people back on their feet in a faster way than this instability. So yeah. thank you very much. I'll be in touch. Yeah. It's there, also there critical. has been uh, about 1.5 million set aside in ARPA funds right. for the purposes of establishing a permanent home for the the uh, homeless in Amherst. The and other we'd thing like the state to chip in too. Go ahead, Pat. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry, Lynn. The other thing that's critically important, and I'll say this to everyone in District 2, we now on 132 North Hampton Road, East Gables, the 28 studio apartments that are going to be, uh, is being, ground will be broken next month, I believe, for that. And we, that was an incredible fight because people don't, because of nimbyism. And we need to look at ourselves as a community so that we really are supporting our homeless, uh, our homeless residents. These are people who are part of our community. Um, and it's exciting that that building is, that, that housing is going up, but we need to do more. And we need as neighbors to open up to everybody. Um, so I'm a little preachy there, but it's uh, an issue that I care a great deal about. Okay. Gerald Downs. Hi, uh, thank you for having this forum. Uh, I'm at 325 Leverett Road, and I just have one issue that I'd like to comment on. It's really the poor quality of, of the asphalt on our road. Um, I've been here uh, since uh, I've been in Amherst since 2005. I've been living here on Leverett Road since um, 2013. And the road is, is continually just patched. I've been patiently hoping that someday I would see it being stripped and repaved, um, but that isn't happening. Every time I see the crew out, you know, just patching another hole, I feel like that's not going to work. Um, and so I would just like to know um, if there's a plan for our road moving forward. Um, but beyond that, I would love it if there is a space for input because I think um, beyond just paving the road, um, uh, our road could probably use some traffic calming measures. 
Uh, the speed limit is 40 miles an hour. I've been told by people who've lived here for longer than we have that um, it's been 40 miles an hour, although many homes have been built along this stretch and now there are lots of kids. So it would be great to revisit the speed limit um, and then also to look into traffic calming measures like some of these fancy digital readback things that I, I see that I actually think have an effect. So I would love to know your thoughts about um, prospects to have something like that happen on our road. Lynn? <laughs> Thanks, I get the roads and the sidewalks, right? I, I love it. When we talk to people who live in the middle of town, they want their sidewalks improved. When you talk to people in our district, they just want sidewalks. Right. That would so, be wonderful. <laughs> like constant battle. Um, there, we have asked the, the uh, uh, superintendent of the Department of Public Works uh, for a schedule of roads. And uh, I am waiting to see when we get the budget and the recommendation from the Joint Capital Planning Committee, whether we have that forthcoming. Uh, at this point, I don't, unless in the last couple of days we've started patching, which I totally hear you. I live on Flathills Road and uh, we're in similar condition, although I think we had a piece of ours paved re sometime in the last five years. Um, the, uh, they can't start doing the patching for the potholes until it warms up enough so that you can do the asphalt that you need to do the patching. But in the end, the patching doesn't keep because then we get another late March snowfall or mid-March snowfall and they just come apart again. So I hear you loud and clear and the calming measure that is very interesting. There is the one on Amity Street and some people who live on Amity Street feel that it has done an amazing job of helping to calm traffic. So um, that along with Bernard just wanting to reduce the traffic uh, speed limit, speed limit um, yeah. this is not uh, this is not an issue that is not that has gone unnoticed. Thank you for speaking up about it, though, Gerald. Thank you, um, Sharon Weisenbaum. Yeah, thank you. Um, I want to take the opportunity to thank Mindy for supporting the H four three three one bill, since I have your ear here. I think. Um, and I also want to thank Lynn and Pat for creating such a warm, um, inviting environment for us. Um, I would like to speak on the um, watershed, the Amherst watershed that involves the Shootsbury plans. I happened to do a tour today of the five and actually six sites where they're going to be, or they're proposed to be solar clear cutting a forest with solar power plants. One of them has already been built and there are five more sites um, with just massive amounts of clear cutting. And it's all in the Amherst watershed. And I found out that Shootsbury is actually 1200 feet high, which is the size of Mount Toby and Mount Tom. The center of Shootsbury is 1200 feet, which is, 900 feet above Amherst. So it's a, like significantly steep downhill and all of these proposed clear cuts are on this hill that feeds into the Amherst watershed. And I know this is a Shootsbury issue that involves Shootsbury bylaws and the Shootsbury government. But my question about this is, as Amherst residents, especially in this district, we're just right at the bottom of the hill. And this is our water supply and, and nature doesn't really have these town boundaries. And so this is like something that's like rushing down the hill, affecting us in Amherst. And so, you know, I really appreciate that we're working on our bylaws in Amherst to site solar intelligently, but what about this looming threat to Amherst that's happening in Shrewsbury. And what's that? I'm, I'm kind of tying back to what Eric brought up. You know, what, what's our relationship as a town to what's going on in, a, in the next town 
that could affect us so profoundly, um, you know, affect our water supply. I mean, Atkins Reservoir, which is this watershed, it's 50% of the Amherst water supply comes from Atkins Reservoir. So I, you know, I don't know if this is answerable, but just like, what's our relationship to this thing? Like this, we're working on it in Shootsbury, but what's the relationship with Amherst? How do we in Amherst work to protect our water? Thank you. Pat, you wanna go? No. Um, one of the things that, you know, that we did try to get a, a temporary moratorium in about intelligent solar siting. Um, and we have managed to get a, 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 a bylaw uh, starting to work about siting solar and what the zoning regulations will be. Um, I think that one of the things that's true is that we need to be working with Shootsbury um, and, because, and, and the maintenance and uh, preservation of forests and things like that um, are critical uh, to maintaining a healthy water supply maintain, and maintaining uh, or fighting climate change. And if you look at the 2050 roadmap, it talks about um, in-ground solar, it talks about photovoltaics, but it equally talks about uh, the preservation of forests. And so it's really in critically important that we work together and you know, thank uh, St. Michael de Chiara uh, for um, doing the work that he's doing in Shootsbury. Um, the watershed plan, I really need to begin to look at. I yeah, sort of yeah. took a break. Um, and, and so I'm not going to be able to comment really intelligently on that. But there, but when you're talking about elevation and things like that and what runoff could be from Shootsbury, we need to look at that. Uh, there are other people here, Ruby Perkins may be able to speak. I don't even know if we would agree about everything, but I think that he could maybe even speak to this issue if he felt like it. Um, Lynn or Rudy? There are other people. Well, I do know that there is a lawsuit now. I believe that Pelham has joined Leverett or Shootsbury. I can't remember which town. That's right. It is. And they've, yeah. they've uh, joined together in a lawsuit because of the way the state law is written. Right. Uh, it really offers very little protection as we went through all the discussions about the potential moratorium on uh, the uh, ground mount, so large ground mount solar, uh, we learned a lot and this issue did come up on a regular basis, particularly because many of the residents that are in the area that is right adjacent to Shootsbury are on wells and septic systems. We're we're part of that 5% of the town that does not have public water and sewer. And so uh, it, it not only concerns about the um, whole issue of our water table, the whole issue that you're talking about, but it also includes our water table levels and the ability to maintain those. And yes, you are correct. Atkins Reservoir is a huge water supply for Amherst. Um, Pat, I think we need to add this to our list to go after, okay? Yes, yes. The other thing is, uh, I'm going to ask people who've already had a chance to ask a question if you would wait till we get to people who haven't had an opportunity. Um, so I just want to let people know of that. That's good. So I'm going to jump over to a moment and go to Rudy Perkins. Oh, thanks very much. Rudy Perkins, uh, Cherry Lane and Amherst. Um, I wanted to start off by thanking Andy and all the counselors working on trying to get uh, a better match out of MSBA that just, it seems terribly behind the times and also of getting them to put some money where their mouth is on net zero and other green features. I think that's a great effort working with our state rep and senator. So thank you for that. And I wanted to thank Lynn and Pat for expressing their commitment to net zero and the net zero bylaws. We go through our, our school project, a really exciting project. But um, I wanted to raise one comment 
in connection with that. I know the town council doesn't really play a role in the siting of the school, but what I think you will end up getting involved with is what we do with the parcel we don't pick for the school. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to be thinking about that now. The decision, as people probably know, is going to be for the school to consolidate the two, Fort River and Wildwood on one of the two sites, either Fort River or Wildwood. And there's pros and cons for each of those sites. I, I, I'm up in the air on, about that. There's a lot of things to be looked at. But I and because it might be a very close decision, I think it would be good to have in the mix what we like about the other site for use, for example, for DPW or fire station, senior center, affordable housing we've talked about tonight and so on. And just I'm not saying it should be the dominant factor, but it would be nice that if the town was already thinking about that and we could weigh that in the decision about which site to pick for the school, be thinking about which site is most appropriate for one of the other top uses and just weigh that as one factor. So I hope you guys can turn to that at some point soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. In fact, I've, I've asked Paul Bockelman about that very issue that do we have a say, meaning we, the council, uh, therefore the town and not just the school building committee and not these schools um, and I he's still looking into it because I think there are uh, I'm like you I've gone back and forth um, and um, on which school would be best and I have thoughts including things like senior centers and early childhood centers for things like the school that we don't use um, so um, I'm not frankly focused at all on DPW because we're trying to work something else out on DPW. So I hope we don't have to use uh, Fort River or, and it certainly is inappropriate to put it at Wildwood. I'm not even clear it's a good, play, good idea to put it at Fort River. For those of you that have ever asked that question, I was uh, chair of the D DPW Fire Station um, Advisory Committee. We, we dissolved in December of 2018. Uh, and while Fort River was listed in the initial documents, it was taken off the table uh, for the very reason of we did not know what the schools were. So it's it's really not back on the table uh, at all. So um, that's just a piece of information that might be useful. I'm looking for hands that we haven't seen tonight, but if I'm not seeing any others, uh, I'm going to go back. Lori hasn't asked a question of us. She asked a question of, uh, or made a comment to Obi, I believe. Right, and also Kitty was the same. Yes. So let, let me just start back over. Uh, Kitty? Okay, Kitty Axelson Berry from 89 Stony Hill Road. I have a few questions and I'm gonna to try to make it brief. Um, first of all, the um, master plan. When will a master plan implementation committee be appointed? It's been, I think, 12 years since the master plan was passed. And one of the main points was that it needs to be implemented. And that, that requires an implementation effort, which means a committee. Currently, the master plan is being cherry picked in ways that many disagree with. So that's my question, a master plan. I'm gonna just say my three things. Um, the same thing goes for a serious study, not only of rental bylaws, but other challenges that face all college towns um, that um, have especially a big university and a small population of full year residents like Amherst. Um, will there be a committee or a working group appointed to study the challenges that we all share and what other towns are doing about it? Finally, um, Ira Brick made a request that the town council seek and rece receive advice from KP Law about the appearance of conflict of interest related to one of our official elected officials, a member of town council, and that is Shalini Balmilne and her business and or personal relationships with landowner Cinda Jones, who owns the forested area that the solar um, had been proposed for a so large solar farm. Um, I urge, um, you to seek out the advice from KP Law as suggested, because um, this individual has made the claim several times 
her own self-assessment that she has provided with the, the ethics commission with. And she says that the ethics commission has said, oh, she has no conflict of interest. But this is unlikely that after such a short conflict conversation, the ethics commission would actually make such a definitive determination based on what she said. In addition, it does not address the appearance of conflict of interest. It only addresses actual conflict of interest. So those are, I'll stop there on those three questions. First of all, master plan implementation. Okay, so the master plan implementation is a, the master plan is adopted by the, is recommended by the planning board and adopted by the town council. Uh, it is regularly appended with additional pieces, um, for example, comprehensive housing policy, et cetera. In terms of an overall committee to do implementation, most of that falls to the Community Resources Committee. However, they have not taken it up as an actual uh, item per se, okay? Mm -hmm. and so it falls to the Planning Board and the Community Resources Committee. Um, but it's something that people regularly have to keep in mind as they develop anything. Uh, with re Pat, do you have anything else you want to say on that? Uh, no, not yet. Okay. Uh, the rental bylaw, um, I think we will know more after Monday when we see the group come forward as to whether there needs to be any other special committees uh, for with regard to rental or whether that will be, uh, again, vested in this case within community resources. Uh, committee. Um, we're aware that there is a group of residents that have been talking about this, uh, but they've also been talking with the people who are working on the drafting of bylaw. Um, and with regard to conflict of interest, uh, I, I, Kitty, <laughs> we're probably never going to agree. The authority on conflict of interest is in fact the Ethics Commission, okay? I personally spent a great deal of time with more than one counselor over the last four, three and a half years, three years and three months to be exact, uh, reviewing conflict of interest, helping them put together their statements, making sure they knew the, the phone number and that they called the ethics commission. I will tell you that you can file a complaint with the ethics commission if you want to, but our lawyers are not the authority on the conflict of interest law. The conflict of interest law is governed by the Ethics Commission of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I, I personally go overboard in doing my conflicts. I just filed one because my husband wrote a letter of support for something, um, but it doesn't mean I can't vote. It just means I'll be upfront about it. Um, Rudy, you have your hand up. I'm gonna to go to Jacob. Hi, thanks for giving me another chance. And I just gotta say, Kitty, those were great questions, but that's an aside. Um, I wanted to make a comment and ask a question about either the planning department or the planning board, I'm not sure whom, but, um, it seems to me that they have become a reaction board. Um, there have been two opportunities for them to vote to support uh, planning in the term in terms of moratorium, and they've voted both of them down. I realize the town council also voted the latest moratorium down, but at least you had an eight to five uh, majority in favor of planning. And it just seems like um, I wonder if the council has discussed the charge for the planning board. I don't, I don't see what they do in terms of planning. Um, I wish that they would create a vision of what downtown Amherst should look like so that we have some idea of how they wanna steer uh, developers or steer proposals. Um, we've gotten to a situation where parking is a real problem. And to me, that only reflects poor planning. Um, what do you think about that? The fact that they're a reaction board and, and not a planning facility? <laughs> oh, goodness. 
Um, my reaction, my honest reaction is, it, this happens to me a lot. When I agree with somebody, I think they're doing a good job. And when I disagree with them, they're doing a bad job. And um, I vote. I did not vote for the building moratorium. I thought that could have a really negative impact on um, downtown development uh, in Amherst. I also was a sponsor of the uh, moratorium, the solar um, siting moratorium. The uh, so and I feel you know it was hard to be defeated. Uh, but we also felt like we moved because with the planning board, literally, when we went to them, when Lynn and I and Anna went to them, they, the majority, it was, I think it was uh, five to two, or I'm, I'm not sure, but there were two people who, and they said, oh, we don't need, we don't need a bylaw. That was their response. We don't need a bylaw. Now they're very busy working on a bylaw. More importantly, we're busy as a town putting together a bylaw committee who will that will be representative of a lot of different areas. Um, the uh, um, uh, Conservation Commission, the Health Department, uh, um, uh, and we're going to be looking at the creation of a siting bylaw that will facilitate the development of solar in Amherst and also protect forests. Uh, yeah, that's my I don't know if I'm still muted, but that's not really my point. My point is, as, as Anna Gauthier said, the solar bylaws more than five years too late. Many towns in Amherst have had solar bylaws for many years. I'm talking about planning. I'm talking about a vision for the future. I think it was supposed to be based on the master plan, although I'm not sure. But since we have a department that's named planning and we have a planning board, it sort of implies that some planning should go on. But I think it does. And I think, I think we have a lot of things that have changed in terms of, we have the CARP plan now that the Energy Act, uh, uh, Committee has brought out. We need to look at that. That's gonna affect planning. I think that uh, I'm going to I'm going to sit here and just struggle with a way of debating with you or getting you to agree with me. So I'm going to let go in a minute. Um, I do think the planning department works very diligently. Uh, they are they respond to counselor requests. They re, uh, respond to committee requests and they listen to residents um, and the planning department. I also think where they're making decisions. Um, what they're, I don't know if they have an overall vision, but I know the planning department does. And Lynn, do you want to get me out of the water that I put myself in or? <laughs> um, I think we're, I think you're not giving enough credit. Okay. So I want to just be very clear about that. Um, the dynamics in town in many ways changed with the creation of the town council. And then with the creation of the town council came the creation of the community resources committee, right. which every, every city, if you will, that has a council has something like that. So one of the things that has been interesting is to watch the dynamics of the community resources committee with the planning board. And there's some people who are very concerned about those dynamics. So I, I have full regard for both groups. I have enormous regard for our planning staff. Uh, and I will say that in the space of the three years of the first council and even the um, two and a half months of the new council, we have thrown more things at them than any department their size could ever manage and still have a thought of their own. Because we get elected, we get elected with an agenda that each of us brings, and then we wanna make sure that that happens. And that's part of what has happened with the change to the new government. So I don't think it's just the responsibility of the planning board or the community resources committee, but also the responsibility of the town council to create a vision and to help move it forward. So I, there's no one answer to this one. 
but I actually do not in any way have a lack of, I have total, I should just say, I wanna say it very positively. I have a total appreciation and respect for our planning staff, our planning board, and the members Jane of the Lynn council. Reesner. She's the I'm president sorry? of the council. She's also my Who's own, speaking? one of my own. Kitty, can you mute, mute please? Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Um, You're still not, yeah, there we go. Andy, do you have your hand up? Yes, I did. Um, I, it's been up for a little while because I wanted to comment a little bit on the question of the watershed issue. Oh, Thank and you. Uh, I, I just didn't have and had the opportunity. Um, I did a fair amount of uh, inquiry in, on, on that issue prior to the vote on the question of a moratorium on the solar. Uh, and uh, specifically, we have two committees that are very much involved in process. And I wanted to make that is related to this. One is uh, mentioned already is the Conservation Commission, which really is working on wetlands, but we also have a watershed protection committee. And if you look uh, on the website, for the names of the people on the Watershed Protection P Committee. That is really an outstanding group. There are a lot of the, they're all people who have substantial knowledge and tech technical expertise in the area. And uh, so I wanted to make sure that if we did not have a moratorium in place and something was going to come forward, which was um, it, appearing unlikely at that time because of the way the sequence of uh, uh, withdrawal and subdivision plans was working out, that if anything came forward during the period before we adopted a bylaw, that uh, the Watershed Protection Committee would be consulted by the Zoning Board of Appeals or Planning Board in the permitting process and I made an inquiry of the town manager um, to get assurance that that was the case and that the Watershed Protection Committee would be represented on the group that would advise on developing a bylaw, and they are. So um, I, I think that uh, it's important to know that that committee exists and that they are looking out very specifically at this issue. The other thing, and Pat mentioned Michael DeChiera, who I've known for many, many years, um, and he's now on the planning board um, and uh, been very active in the solar issues in Shrewsbury. And uh, I, you know, they have, they are one of the towns that has had a bylaw in place for a while on regulating solar. And um, I uh, have not had an opportunity to talk with Michael about specifically whether he's looking out for the watershed for both towns, but uh, I think that their bylaw and uh, Michael's uh, commitment and understanding that um, he, uh, I'm, I'm fairly confident that he is uh, looking out for it from the Shootsbury side, I think, but it is, you know, what our um, uh, piece is going to have to be to make sure that as we develop a bylaw that we do it appropriately. And that's why I'm so happy that uh, the town manager had suggested, took a suggestion and to designate somebody from the Watershed Protection Committee to be um, on the group that is advising on bylaw development. So that, that was uh, what I wanted to add, Lynn. Thank you, Andy. And that's that item actually just came before the council for information on the 7th. Lori Gardner? Goldner, yeah. Goldner, I can't, sorry. <laughs> need new, need, need a new prescription. Okay, I'm at 111 Albanwood Road, and um, I wanted to say something that I have heard said many times now at the various meetings of town councils and, and committees. 
Um, so I'm an environmentalist my whole life, and I am also a physicist, a scientist, and um, have been very interested lately in energy policy and policy around the energy transition. This has always been something I've concerned about. Um, one of the things that I learned in in looking into the energy transition is, and as concerns forests and sequestering of carbon, is that the way we manage forests in Massachusetts, any forest that ever gets logged, and that's all state forests and anything owned by coals, um, they're they're harvested on a sixty year time scale, and that sixty years is exactly the point where they start to become good carbon sequestering places. Okay, so our forests are not good sequesters of carbon if we are in fact logging them. Worse than that is if the land has ever been tilled, which most of the land has, the timeline is even longer. So this was heartbreaking for me to find out. And I cannot stress how important it is when making decisions about cutting forests that we do it in a way that is environmentally sensitive because you can just, you know, everyone knows we can destroy, we've all seen the results of clear cutting and what can happen. Uh, it can be a complete disaster, but we need to be thinking about the whole picture here. And I want to encourage our, my counselors to please, uh, you know, be aware that our forests, people like to think we should never cut forests because there's such good carbon sinks, but that is not in fact what we do in Massachusetts. We do not keep them as good carbon sinks. And if we're not, we have to ask ourselves if we want to do what's best for the planet. Perhaps this is a site where there might be a better, better be a solar, uh, you know, a solar array or a wind array. Um, you know, I, I hate to say that as an environmentalist, but it, it's just the truth. So, uh, you know, there is, an, there is an organization in Massachusetts that I ran into a while ago that I know is fighting to change the way we manage our forests. And I sort of hope that happens. Um, but as long as we keep doing things the way we're doing them, I just wanted you to realize this. Um, and that, that's all I had to say. I just wanted to throw that out there because I hadn't heard it mentioned in all of the talk about uh, forests and cutting. Thank you, Lori. That's important information and I appreciate hearing it very much. Alicia Campbell, please. Thank you. Um, I, I did want to say just one thing about planning boards, which is they are cr created by state law and the state has certain things they want planning boards to do. So mm -hmm. we then ask them to do other things also, but they have certain obligations under the state. I have a totally different question mm -hmm. because I have, you know, during the re redistricting, I found out that I will at some point not be in your district anymore. But it's not clear to me when that's true. Is it clear to you? When does redistricting take uh, effect? Yes, I, it is very clear to me. And let me explain that to Please. you now. First of all, Elisha, Elisha, I actually thought you stayed, but I could I'm be south wrong. Of route I'm south of Route 9. I think I don't. No, what's route oh. district district two is virtually unchanged except oh, okay. for a very small portion um, at the northern part ah. of the district. But okay. before I commit to that, I'll go back and look at the map. Thanks. I but guess some of the map I saw me. wasn't adopted, some other map okay. was. Okay, thank so, you. <laughs> let me explain this. As of uh, next on March 21st we will begin the process of uh, identifying the voting locations for each of the precincts. Precincts in the future will be called, and this all begins to apply to the elections in September, the preliminary primary elections for uh, state, and then the November elections, okay? So you are already in your new precinct, okay? So precinct district two, which has normally been precinct two and precinct seven, will actually be precinct two A and precinct two B. I'm sorry, you're right. It was precinct two and six, okay? And the voting places were the fire station, and the uh, Fort River Fort School. River. And more recently, Precinct 2 voted at the high school, okay? So on Monday, the 21st, the Clerk of the Council will be coming to us with the recommendations for 
how the different precincts will be assigned to their new voting places. That will be the kickoff. And those precincts, by the way, have been approved. We had a redistricting committee that did a phenomenal job in a, an extremely short period of time. I have a, a really talented group. And uh, they looked at, I think it was something close to 20 different maps right. of how to break up Amherst, okay? And it's all driven by population. We now have a population of about 39,000 plus. Um, so once we decide where the polling places are, you will start receiving in the mail information about where you will vote, okay? The biggest changes were around what is now District 3, which is the Amity Street uh, part of downtown. And that district was changed enormously. Yep. But District 2 actually did not have nearly as many changes as we thought. But the education process, to end, the short answer is very soon you will start learning where you will vote in September, okay? Uh, Sharon. Uh, Actually, I think Eric had his hand up before oh, me. Eric? But it was, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you, Sharon, and thank you, Lynn. I just wanted to add uh, to what Andy uh, indicated uh, a few minutes ago that I was particularly gratified to see uh, the appointment of somebody from the Board of Health on the water supply, the uh, si solar siting working group, as it's the Board of Health that is has the fiduciary, fiduciary responsibility uh, regulating the quality and health of the uh, the uh, the quality and the and the um, quality of our drinking water that is that the people who derive it through through wells. So. Um, the Public Water Supply Protection Committee governs public water, but it's the health department that governs um, private wells derived from private water. So thank you for getting that appointment to the uh, working group as well. Well, I have to say it was in large part due to several District 2 residents who wrote the town manager when they first saw the description of the committee that that position was added. So advocacy works. Uh, and we appreciate the fact that you did that. Sharon. Thank you. And I'm, I forgot to do this before, but I'm Sharon Weisenbaum and 86 Henry Street in Amherst. And, um, I wanted to respond to what Lori said about maybe these forests, since they're not that old, are okay to be clear cut. And I just wanna really emphasize how much the forests do for us. It's so much more than carbon sequestration that they absorb water and they prevent flooding and erosion. And they also um, clean, the water. And so our wetlands and our, our water are really at risk if these forests are clear cut by the amount of water that's going to rush down that soil that is not held by the forest. And that, that's a huge concern for me. And, um, and I want to just also talk about the Shootsbury Road um, proposal um, and that watershed and that the residents along that road and just that proposal is in a residential area. It's like building a huge power plant in a residential area, clear cutting that entire forest that's bigger than 34 football fields. And what about their wells? And then it, it feeds into the Amethyst Brook and into so many wetlands, you know, the Northeast Street area where it opens up is just all wetlands and that you know what's going to happen to them if the forest uphill from that gets cleared um and so i'm wondering also about the watershed protection committee and you know it's wonderful that they're there and i think they're wonderful people and um i feel confident in their um strength to protect us but then that it makes me wonder then about 
Shutesbury. Like, you know, that's this huge effect on Amherst. And what do they have? They don't have any power to affect Shutesbury. And just to point out that even though Shutesbury has fantastic bylaws, they might mean nothing because that right now in the state, the solar industry has the power to sue our town and win, you know, saying that we can't limit their ability to build solar wherever they want, however they want, and clear cut for us. And so even our bylaws at a state level might be really meaningless. And I think it's important for us to keep that in mind in Amherst when we're thinking about protecting our water. Like how how much power do we have? We can't count on Shutesbury to protect Amherst water because we maybe can't protect it. So anyway, those are those are the thoughts I wanted to add. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Thanks. Marcy. Oh, Lori's agreeing. Thanks. Um so I um I understand we're all you know, trying to protect the wildlife and the the forests and our community. And I love I love all of that energy and the bylaw is going to be great. But I would like to add <laughs> just the question. Um, you know, we have a timeline about uh, reducing fossil fuels. We have a timeline for the climate and, you know, disaster. And I'm hearing a lot about where it's not okay to put up solar. Um, so I'm hoping that there will be effort and energy put into where would be a good place to put up solar. And um, <clears throat> I know solar isn't the only answer. I love Mindy talking about wind initiatives, um, but we, you know, <laughs> we have a huge global and as well as local problem going on. And I, um, I just want us to have the perspective if it's not a good place here to put up solar, if it's not good in Shutesbury, well, where is it good? And where can we use that uh, technology to our benefit in terms of getting rid of the fossil fuel um, imbalance? So I've spoken to some of the friends on um, smart solar, you know, Amherst and Western Mass, and I don't want to be a naysayer to their efforts. I really appreciate, you know, I live in the woods and I appreciate their efforts and I live near Atkins Reservoir. So I'm hearing all of that in a good way, but I also really want to know, could we, <laughs> could we find um, solutions that are positive using solar as well? So thanks, that's all I wanted to, to share. So one of the, there's two things that happened. There's many things that happened in the process of coming forward with the proposed moratorium. First of all, the planning board moved from not feeling we needed a bylaw to actually feeling we do need a bylaw and actively talking about it. And in many ways, I think that's as important as anything. The other thing is that the um, ECAC, Energy Climate Action Committee, uh, also convinced the town that they needed to do a solar siting map. And that map is not just, um, you know, fields and forests, it's buildings, it's parking lots, it's all of the places that are presently developed. So, for example, the police station in downtown is slated to get a new roof sometime in the next year or two. Well, once it gets a new roof, it can also become a place where you put solar because you don't want to put solar on a roof that you have to replace in another three years. You want the roof to happen and then the solar to happen right after. So those kinds of issues are part of the solar siting study as well as issues related to racial and social justice and other and environmental issues as well. Um, I, please, I urge any of you that are interested in the committees, uh, please submit your, communi your uh, community action form, CAF, community action form. Yeah. Citizens. Yeah. And, and Citizens anyway, action form, thank you. And the you other find thing that that's on the website. Yeah, the other thing that's critical is to 
address with our state senators and representatives and our, our um, uh, that we need funding mm -hmm. to build, put solar on rooftops to retrofit homes. And particularly people of low income need the support, the financial support to do this. That to me is even more critical than a full, uh, the in-ground solar. Uh, not that, and I'm not opposed to in-ground solar. I'm just oppo I'm opposed to clear cutting a hundred acres when you could have a smaller array. Mm -hmm. But it is critical that if we have to look at the social justice aspect of this, and that's very easily ignored. We speak to it, but you know, everybody here should be contacting Kobe. They should be contacting Mindy and and uh, Joe and. Uh, Senator uh, Markey and uh, Warren and McGovern, because we need to be able to retrofit homes. And we need that in Hamden County. We need that in Hampshire County. We need it everywhere. So that becomes a critical aspect of the work that we need to do. Renee? Yeah, yeah, just... Um just to um, I support what what you just said, Pat, and I, I think in response to what Marcy was asking, you know, several years ago, or maybe, no, within the last two years, we had the niche report, the niche report was uh, was commissioned by the town was paid for by the town, and it identified the roofs It identified the disturbed fields rather than the forest it identified all these places to put up solar, but the town didn't act on it. Nothing was done. Right. It was just identified. And then the so and then we had a multinational develop, you know, corporation come in to do it with a private landowner. And it was a matter of, well, that wouldn't cost the town anything. So, you know, that's when action started because it was a reaction to what was being proposed that, um, Many scientists, many of us thought saw as detrimental. But meanwhile, the town had all this information about places where solar would be appropriate on municipal building rooftops, on disturbed fields. I mean, if we look at the solar array at Hampshire College, that was on a disturbed field. There was no clear cutting for that. So we have to, you know, advocate for ways of of, of building of spending the money because in the long run, the expense will be much greater if we make, as the, the state has said in its, um, in its smart oh, 2050 report, the 2050, the roadmap has said, don't do, do not do land with no regrets, put solar where there's no regrets. When we start clear cutting forests, there will be regrets. Look at Conway, look at Williamsburg. We have so many examples of places where it was clear cut and there are, there are severe regrets. It's heartbreaking what has happened in these places. And I haven't heard any stories of clear cutting where there weren't problems. So um, I suggest we do it and we do it right. And we do the right combination of solar. And what Jack Hurst talked about before was a company in East Hampton that's developing renewable energy that, that's not solar. Solar is not the be all and end all. It's a small piece of the puzzle. We're gonna do it. We're gonna get renewable energy and we're gonna do it right. And we're gonna have solar, we're gonna have wind and we're gonna have technology that we don't even know about yet. And I'm going to say that we have gone over time, and that's fine, honestly. But I'm wondering, uh, it, no, I really mean that. It is fine. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at people who are attendees who were not in the room, and I really want to know if any of them uh, have a question or comment uh, or something that they want to share before. While we're waiting for that, let me also mention that uh, Alicia Walker, who's an at-large counselor, had hoped to be with us tonight, but had a last minute uh, family situation she needed to deal with. So she was not. She was going to talk about the implementation of the CREST program and uh, the terrific new director that we have just hired. And perhaps we uh, will be able to have him join us at a district meeting sometime um, in mid-spring or so. Um, 
Are there any other questions or comments? I mean, hey, this is early for Pat and I on a Monday night. Sometimes we're here till 11 <laughs> or even later, Andy. <laughs> nice to see you still. <laughs> any other comments or questions? Yes, Kathleen Bridgewater. You're muted, Kathleen. You need to unmute, Kathleen. Unmute. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. I just was saying thank you um, that this was a, a good uh, evening to put together. I don't have a lot more to say, but I do want to speak up and, and um, comment that there are people who said some very important things tonight. And among them were Sharon's uh, issues containing, uh, concerning the forest and the many things that forests do other than just sequestering after 60 years sequestering. They can't get to the point of sequestering if they're chopped down. Um, yes. I, point. you know, if we're, if we're going to get to the point of really being able to clean out carbon through woods, that's going to be a part of it. It's also uh, around here, we are aware of a lot of wildlife and talking about a little six inch space underneath fencing for animals to be able to move along on their way is really it, it's 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 specious the to when you start fragment fragmenting the woods in this area it causes many problems not only for the the animals that need to get around from place to place but also for the concentration of certain types of insects that might not necessarily be something that you want to do. Um, I won't get into all of that right now, but the whole, the thing that I've learned in the past two years of trying to understand what's going on and uh, is that this is a really complex issue. And we all think we know a lot about it until we hear more about it. And then we re realize that people are trying to make decisions and consider that there's no emergency when there really is an emergency. And the emergency is, is that we need to take the time to truly find out what the issues are. And um, that concerns me a great deal. I also want to say that um, the issues about the perception of conflict of interest it really does uh, concern me. And perception is as a, a dear, uh, is a concern as much as the actual handing money over back and forth between people. But when you can go on the internet and very easily see which people have, uh, have beneficial business interests that are shared between uh, two individuals or two other individuals who are involved in town um, on town committees, it becomes it becomes something where I I, I frankly um, lose a, a certain degree of trust in the process. And when people go and vote in a way that supports the people with whom they have business interests, where they're they're complementing each other. Uh, online when they say, I love this person's business um, to for one another. That is just like a person who, who endorses someone else's book. Those are very valuable endorsements. And those endorsements may, do not necessarily mean that money changes hand, hands, but there is a value that, it, that can be um, gotten from those relationships. And it is, I think, um, it, it's it's foolish to consider that you can say, well, I know that I would not be be prejudiced in favor of my friend and and business associate. Uh, that's why we have conflict of interest laws, and if the conflict of interest laws are not sufficient to uh, to get into those problems at least one should care about the perception. And the perception is pretty strong when you can see in some cases, actual money taking, changing hands during the process of, um, of elections. 
and supporting uh, supporting people in an election and then voting on the, the donor's business when it comes before the town council. Um, so I understand that that the, the state ethics commission was involved, but to what degree the state ethics commission truly understood the depth of what was going on on the internet that was clear from the internet just for anybody who takes a look um this this just doesn't seem to be ethical to me um so uh, that's one of my concerns um and i guess that's all i want to say <laughs> so thank well, you so much and thank you for sharing that i'm gonna skip to barbara ford because she's not spoken Hi, Barbara. You have to unmute. Here you go. Um, thank you. Thank you. I think this this particular meeting has been far better than the first one, which I attended way back when. Um, we've covered a lot of territory, and. Um, I'm interested in many of the subjects, particularly the issue of clear cutting, which we may or may not be able to ever recover in the future, our future. But the thing I wanted to mention was I think the council is considering or has considered going back in person. And if you're going to do that, it's been very hard to see people's faces um, on, on the television. And I'm, I really have appreciated being able to see them up close and personal in the Zoom-ish parts. And in, so maybe you want to start thinking about pushing uh, CCA TV or whatever we call it. Um, that's not it. But anyway, um, to do something tactically that improves on that situation, because certainly there are long distance views. You can't tell what's going on when people are speaking too. So let me just that's that will be the suggestion. Yeah, it will be coming up again on, on the 21st. Uh, it was delayed um, uh, from the- I have an agreement right sitting next to me and the other person in my household agrees with that particular thing. Okay, that's it. Thank you. So we will be- um, now. <laughs> We will be um, voting on our form of, our format, if you will, for meetings uh, on the 21st. No matter whether we go back in person, which we've been doing actually since January, Oops, or, I lowered my hand. I thought um, we need you to actually uh, mute. I'm trying to. Okay, all right. Uh, whether we go back in person or not, we actually did starting in January, went back in person, but it's been optional for counselors to continue to attend virtually. Those of us that have been in the room wear masks and we have made, even though we have lifted the mask mandate in Amherst, we can individually choose to continue to wear masks. Uh, and I have personally not decided what I plan to do, although I am... Um, because I've been very conservative in my own personal behavior from the beginning. The governor extended the ability for councils and other bodies to meet virtually till July 15th. Uh, and uh, we, uh, what we have learned is that when we are in the room and we have a we have to have, first of all, the town manager has to be there. We have to have an IT person and we have to have by law, a minute taker in the room. If we tried to do that for every committee, it would be financially prohibitive. But our goal with the town council is to continue to create access via Zoom for all people 
so that they can continue to attend the meetings uh, and make public comment by Zoom. How we handle our committees is still a kind of an unknown and the vote on Monday will be a critical vote, uh, particularly now that the mask mandate has been lifted. Pat, did you wanna to add to that or Andy? Not right now, no. Andy? Andy? Not on that issue. I had one more thing on solar lighter when you get to me again. Okay, why don't you go <laughs> ahead, Andy? Well, I just wanted to Jacob. point. Yeah, um, I just wanted to uh, um, answer or at least provide a little information that some people may not have about the whole thing with the regulation of solar and what the towns are allowed to do or not allowed to do. Um, Section 40A of the Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 40A, Section 3 has a sentence in it. The subject is um, about what towns are not allowed to do within their zoning. And the sentence that we we're always talking about, and Lynn and I have been talking about the sentence to the point where I think we're bleary eyed looking at it, no zoning ordinance or bylaw shall prohibit or unreasonably regulate the installation of solar energy systems or the building of structures that facilitate facilitate the collection of solar energy except where necessary to protect the public health safety and welfare so you, uh, one big question that we're constantly um, needing to address is how do we construct a bylaw that makes sure that it talks about everything in terms of we're doing this because it is necessary to protect public health, safety, or welfare. Um, in my mind, clearly the subject that's been a lot of discussion tonight about water quality fits within that category. Um, the other things to just know about this, and this goes back, and I apologize for playing the uh, retired lawyer part of this, but um, I will anyway. Uh, the uh, Kate, the lawsuit that was referred to earlier was filed, um, involved um, Waltham, which is of course right in the 128 tract and in the Boston area. And um, so that it was over land that was not really analogous to what we're talking about in Western Massachusetts communities, but um, the developer who was denied uh, by the uh, planning or zoning board um, the permission to move forward with a um, solar development um, claimed that it was in violation of the statutory section that I just cited. And they uh, brought the lawsuit. Um, and I think that um, some people know there's a little bit of reference to the fact that both Pelham and Shutesbury that currently already have solar bylaws have joined into that lawsuit um, is, and provided uh, a brief um, and actually heard a presentation by the attorney who's representing the interveners and uh, learned a lot about the whole litigation from doing so. The other thing that um, I'm aware of, and I'm sorry that Mindy is not currently on the call, but I believe that the legislature is thinking about um, whether there are changes that need to be made to the statutory section. And uh, I think that that's something that um, anybody who's interested in can talk to um, Mindy or Joe Comerford about okay. because it, it's something that could come forward. Okay. Um, Jacob, you still have your hand up. Yes, I'd like to make um, one comment and then totally change the subject. Um, but I learned about the Water Protection um, Committee and looked them up this afternoon. And they had a meeting in the middle of January and the minutes haven't been posted yet. 
So I'm wondering if that's something that you can uh, facilitate. That's actually an issue that is a common issue for many committees. Um, I will just tell you that when I chaired the DPW Fire Station Advisory Committee, we were responsible for doing our own minutes. So uh, it's not a small task, uh, but we did make sure they got posted. But I will mention that particularly, Jacob. Thanks. The other thing I wanted to, um, and this, take a deep breath. This is very uh, different topic. I've been living in Amherst for a little over 40 years and um, my memory isn't great, but we have one new industry in all that time that I noticed, and that's the marijuana industry. I'm really thrilled that profits have gone from cartels and the mafia to private industry and the government. And I'm wondering how much money has Amherst made? As I drove around today, I saw, I think five dispensaries. How much money does Amherst get as kickbacks from the taxes on the marijuana? We, <laughs> I think kickbacks is probably not the right term, but <laughs> nevertheless, uh, let me start by saying, we're just learning because actually the most recent dispensary just opened. We actually, I believe, have three recreational marijuana facilities and two medicinal. Uh, I'm, this is not an industry, to be honest. I have a lot of involvement. <laughs> just, well, it's not, it's just but, not my. But thing. you get to spend uh, the money. But right? I do understand, and uh, we really don't have a good fix this year. When we see the budget, we will have a better idea of what that revenue looks like, uh, and some of the revenue is already committed to um, helping people overcome addiction, et cetera, and so forth. So some of it's prescribed and the rest goes to the general coffers of the town and then gets redistributed as part of the budget. Yeah. So we'll have a better sense. The budget uh, from the town Any manager- Any hint, is it millions or is it no, thousands? Oh my God, no, no. I think it's in the hundreds, hundreds of thousands that if we're lucky. Okay. Hundreds of thousands. Okay. Yeah, I, I think the figure last year was around two hundred and ten thousand or something like that. Right. Andy, right? Yeah, I got it. Uh, so it's we're not talking a lot of money, uh, and, and we're also um, it's looking also, at that money to for reparations. Uh, once we figure out how we will be able to establish a reparations fund, right? Yeah. That, looking at it, we're looking at the equivalent of. Yes. Not, not the actual yes. amount. Yes, yes. Um, so um, anyway, that is that is the best answer we can give you. And the, but the uh, town manager releases his budget on uh, to the town council on May 2nd. And we begin a month long, very intensive process. Andy is chair of the finance committee. I'm a member of the finance committee. Pat's been on the finance committee. Uh, we basically meet twice a week for the next four weeks after that budget is released and um, begin that process. So we'll know better then is my best answer for now. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Nancy, anything? <laughs> no, this was great. Very informative. And I just want to say thank you to both of you for doing this. Thanks. Thanks. This is this has been our most well attended yeah. district meeting. So thanks for joining us. And yeah, really and truly, um, thank you. It's now eight forty six, and I'm going to say the meeting's adjourned. Can I do that? Yes. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. You're thanks, welcome. Kid. Thank you. Let's get more. She said there were two medical dispensaries.